to thank you um, for, and thank this institute for the opportunity to come and deliver address to you, an address to you this afternoon because um, any time we can talk about hunger, ending hunger, ending chronic malnutrition with opinion leaders in a country that provides the kind of consistent support of Ireland, it's a win for us. And so we appreciate having this opportunity to dialogue with you this afternoon. And Ireland's always a particular pleasure for me to visit. This is my second trip to Ireland, my second address before an audience here. Um, in a 12-month period because uh, Ireland, as I, you heard me say this morning, is incredibly important. Not just because um, we have a strategic partnership agreement, but because we have NGO partners here who are also our partners in the field. Um, and it's an opportunity to say thank you to them. And it is an opportunity for us, more importantly, to talk to the taxpayers about how their money is invested, the value of their money being invested in WFP, and that if we are to win the crucial and important role in the fight to end hunger, that we must continue to have the support of Ireland and her people. So thank you all very much for this opportunity. Um, the WFP, as the world's largest hunger relief organization, is, is of course very, very thankful for the support that we've received from Ireland, but we're not surprised by it because this is a country that has a history um, as well as a present day em empathy that demonstrates uh, the enlightened global leadership around the issues of hunger and most recently around the issues of chronic malnutrition that has provided the leadership that is necessary for us to generate the public will that is required if we are to truly address these issues in our lifetime. And uh, often people um, highlight the history of, of Ireland and the challenges that this country faced uh, as, related to, as related to hunger. And uh, I, was, I was, because it wasn't raining yesterday, able to go to the Irish Famine Exhibit and see the faces of those who who are memorialized there, who were forced to leave this country because of hunger. But I tell you, the expression of those faces was very, very similar and familiar to me, of faces that I see in too many places today around the world. Whether it's in a refugee camp in Dadaab, um, a mother in a refugee camp in, in, um, in Jordan who's fled the Syrian conflict, or it's in the Philippines when a, well, you're talking to a mother or a father who has lost everything because of the typhoon, and they're just grateful for the food that we are bringing them. So while we are all thankful that the famines that, that created the history and be, have become a part of the history of this country are rare today, the reality is the challenge of lack of food, lack of access to nutritious food still exists. And unfortunately, in 2014, babies still die because of lack of access to food. So people say, is there a hunger crisis? Of course there's a crisis. If 842 million people are food insecure and 165 million children are chronically malnourished, that is a crisis. It is particularly a crisis because we know the answers to, why, to how to overcome the challenges of food insecurity and chronic malnourishment. And we know that failure 
to address these challenges creates not just me physical deprivation, mental deprivation, but also a lack of hope that is required for full development of any child in their lifetime. So the facts are clear. We know that stunted girls and boys are more likely to underperform in school. Uh, we know that girls are likely to leave school younger, marry earlier, deliver her first child er earlier, who is also more likely to be chronically malnourished if she was chronically malnourished. And we know that they, she will bear more children than the average in our country. In many of these countries, that average is unreasonably high for the access that they have to food. We know that both boys and girls earn lower wages when they're chronically malnourished early in life. We know that they are more prone, both boys and girls, to chronic disease and poor health. And we know that both boys and girls who are chronically malnourished in life are more likely to live that life in poverty. So sadly, these effects are not limited to one child. They pass from generation to generation as well. And we know that these, the challenges of chronic malnutrition resulting in mental and physical stuntings don't occur in just one part of the world. We know that in countries like Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Mali, Timor-Leste, Yemen, yes, I can go on and on and on, that in too many of these countries, one in every two children is stunted. Think about that for a moment. Pick any of the countries that I've named, any of the countries that you know that I didn't name, and then look to your left and right. Look to your left and right. Look to your left and right. That person sitting next to you would be stunted in any of these countries. And we know that that person sitting next to you would be suffering from irreversible, irreversible challenges that we've outlined as a result of chronic malnutrition and stunting. But the damage doesn't stop there, because it's not just the individual damage. We know that in the countries where these individuals live, that economic growth is also impacted by the stunting of the individual. We know that that the global level, hunger and undernourishment are estimated to cost two to three percent of gross domestic GDP each year, which is equivalent to 1.4 to 1 to 2.1 trillion dollars a year. We also know that you can look at those numbers from a country level. And we know that economic productivity is detrimentally impacted by undernutrition and hunger. On average, in some countries, from 6% of GDP in Uganda, for example, to 16% of GDP in Ethiopia. Similar studies in Latin America have estimated the cost of hunger and chronic malnutrition to be as high as 11% of GDP in both Guatemala and Honduras. So it's not just about the individuals. There is a societal impact that occurs from hunger and malnutrition. The, and, and the you know, I, when I, whenever I begin to, to, to talk about the economic data, people say to me, but Earthman, isn't it just wrong, morally and humanely wrong, for us to live in a world where it's not just about the numbers, but it's about the lives? Um, because we know that in too many cases, hunger is also the root of the security in particular countries. For example, when I was in Yemen, 
recently, the president said to me, I asked him, he said to me in response to a question that I asked him, when I asked what was his biggest challenge today? And he said to me, food security is my biggest challenge. He said, because without food security, I cannot, we will not have security in Yemen. We can't have peace without security, without food security. So today, we are fortunate. We understand the cost of, of hunger from an economic standpoint, from an individual uh, lifestyle impact standpoint, from the global impact that it has on us creating a world that is more peaceful. And we also know the solutions. We have the science, we have the understanding, we have the technology to address the problems of hunger and chronic malnutrition. But to implement those solutions requires a public will that doesn't depend on a CNN moment or BBC moment or an IRC moment. It requires a recognition that we cannot make the change that is required without sustained investment in the programs and projects that will provide the difference. It is as much as or more an issue of economic policy as it is one of welfare, social protection, and human rights policies. When it comes to hunger, we must be a rights-based, solution-driven global community committed to meeting this challenge. That is the only way that we can get to zero hunger. And uh, zero hunger is what we should strive for, because any other number other than zero hunger, and I've been told maybe I'm far too ambitious, but what do you say, 5% is OK, 10% is OK? So it must be about zero hunger, the elimination of, poverty, of hunger, the elimination of chronic malnutrition, because those are the master keys to unlocking what is the door, not only to child development, but to stable political futures and strong economies around the world. The factors of uh, in addressing the, or the, the, the tools in addressing hunger and chronic malnutrition, oftentimes many in the economic community would say growth is enough. If we have economic opportunity that we can achieve the goals of zero hunger. But we know that Income inequality is a factor that lies behind the failure of most of the world's hungry poor to meet their food needs. And we know that achieving greater income, in, 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 greater income equality will be an important part of solving the challenges of hunger, but it's not enough alone. Because where there have been communities that suffered from prolonged food insecurity and prolonged chronic malnutrition without the interventions of safety nets and social protection programs and education programs about what are the right foods how can you have the right agricultural production that supports the intake of the appropriate nutritional requirements, um, what is the right product mix for a mother who is shopping, who has never had access to income before to fully purchase the, and the foods that are necessary to meet the needs of her child, that the answers will not provide the solutions that are necessary to achieve zero hunger and the elimination of chronic malnutrition. So we must have these more inclusive and directed and targeted interventions. It's 
transformative change that we're talking about and nothing less. Transformative change in how we think about the solutions, the recognition of the length of time that it will take us to focus and address the targeted challenges to achieve the outcomes that we share, and transformative change in the economic community to ensure that we can build the global momentum that is necessary to support the additional interventions that will be required beyond simple economic growth, where today we don't have the support of many economists around the world for these additional tools that are required to meet these needs. You know, some call it resilience, that we need to focus more on resilience with this population because they um, are, so, they are so, they've, they've suffered for so long from the challenges of, of prolonged food insecurity and uh, chronic malnutrition that they are much more vulnerable to shocks and crisis. Call it resilience if you'd like. I don't want to debate words. Uh, what we know are what are the actions that are required. We must build additional coping mechanisms in these populations. Because it's sustainability that's necessary and durability that's required in order to ensure that what we achieve today will, we can maintain in these populations over the longer period of, over longer periods of time, over a lifetime. They, and so we need, the, these populations need the mechanisms that allow them to weather the storms that will inevitably occur, particularly in the places where the people who are most vulnerable live today. Whether those are the challenges of natural disasters or climate change, we must build that resiliency, those mechanisms, that strength that ensures that the food security that a, com a, a community and individual experiences today that they can maintain in the future. And that's why, again, the social safety nets that help ensure that people escape vicious cycles of chronic hunger are so important. It's, there, there, there's so much more that we can do today because we recognize that the tools exist. I, I smile when people say you are so positive all the time that we can do this. And I said 50 years ago when WFP was founded, China was our largest recipient country. And today, and the world said China would never feed itself, that they would always be required to have WFP or other donor support in order to feed their population. But much of what we are talking, what I am talking about now, was implemented by China. And we know where they are today. But we also know that they have a bottom quintile of population that totals almost 100 million people that are still, who have still not yet benefited from the growth that China has experienced. And which is why China is now working with WFP to implement the kinds of programs, social safety net programs, school feeding programs, um, as well as education programs about nutritious foods for that more vulnerable population. It's, 
the, the, I can spend a lot of time talking about tools and programs and what policies we should implement to end hunger and chronic malnutrition. And, but there are many more that many of you in this room have much more experience implementing than even WFP, which is why partnerships are so important. Because we recognize that we don't have all the answers and the only way we will achieve the goals that we share is if we learn lessons from each other in the implementation of these programs, in the support for the policies that are necessary, whether those, support, those policies are the, uh, local policies or global policies. Because not only will one organization alone not solve this problem, no single government, no single enterprise working alone will solve the problem. Eliminating hunger is a shared goal and a shared responsibility. But this shared goal is vital to achieving the goal that we all aspire to. And that is a world without want. When the world comes together to discuss these goals, whether it's the Sustainable Development Goals or the Millennium Development Goals, we know that food and nutrition security must be on the agenda. And that we must all support that goal in order to ensure that civil society, member states, private sector, uh, are all working together, not just to achieve it, but in order to ensure that we are providing the transformative activity that is required to achieve it. And the member states in the United Nations are working right now to support the next set of Millennium Development Goals, where we are hopeful that the food and nutrition security will be a standalone goal. And we are hopeful that all of you will use your voices in helping ensure that it will be a standalone goal. Because if we are to build stable and productive societies, goal setting must acknowledge the ability of the poorest and the most vulnerable to ultimately feed themselves if we are willing to work together to achieve the desired outcomes. And that is enough said because I've made the case for why and what we need to do. So I'd like to conclude with one thought. Yesterday, as I told you, because it wasn't raining, I was able to spend a few moments at the famine memorial. And when I mentioned the memorial before, many of you nodded your heads because that is a memorial that you all know much better than I do. And you know the faces of the people that are memorialized. But we also know that they, if they could look at Ireland today and see what has become of the country they left and the opportunity that has been provided to so many that they left behind, they would encourage us to do more, to ensure that the Irish experience is an experience that's shared by men and women around the world. That hunger becomes a thing of history for more countries, for more communities, and for more families. It reminds me of a comment from Frederick Douglass, who spent a lot of time here in Ireland during that very same period of the Irish famine. And he said, where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. 
as long as there is a hungry child, as long as there are men and women who put their children to bed hungry at night, we as a global community will not be secure. We will not be safe. We will not have the future that we want for our children. And Frederick Douglass went on to say, our destiny is in our hands. We know the answers to ending hunger. We have the tools to end hunger, to end hunger, to end food insecurity, and to end chronic malnutrition. Our destiny, the world's destiny, the destiny of the world's hungry poor is in each of our hands. And we can make the difference in our lifetimes. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I look forward to your questions.